Um, I will be telling you our, our story um, of how we started and how we have gotten to the point now of producing diagnostic proteins in plants um, for Africa. So this is just an overview of, of the structure of my talk. Um, I'll give you a bit of company background history. Um, we'll go into the plant-based platform and, and how it works. I'm sure many of you already know, but uh, there, there might be some, some new recruits. Um, also going into benefits of the plant-based platform, um, talking about our scale-up from lab to production scale, which I'm sure many of you know when you try and scale up an experiment, even it, it's never as simple as you think. Um, and then into some of our production capacities, where we're at now, um, our current products and our current customers. Um, and then the local diagnostic test kit landscape, which um, I've gotten to know quite well over the last year and a bit. And it's, it's been quite interesting. Um, and finally, we'll talk about collaborations, future products that we, we are focused on making. Um, and then our vision of eventually moving into vaccines, therapeutic antibodies, and spreading and duplicating ourselves uh, throughout the African continent. So just to give you some background on our stakeholders and our origin story, um, like every superhero has an origin story, this is how um, we came about. So the Biofarming Research Unit, as Georgia mentioned, uh, led by Professor Ed Rubisky, has been producing proteins and plants for the last 20 plus years. Um, they've really optimized the process and have produced a range of um, subunit vaccines and other enzymes and antibodies um, in Nicotiana benthamiana plants. So Professor Ed Rubisky was giving a, a TEDx talk in Cape Town in 2014, which um, my brother actually um, insisted that, that my, my mother and I join him and, and go and, and watch. And um, I'm really glad that we went with <laughs> because um, Professor Rubisky got on stage and he started talking about producing vaccines in plants and how um, this would be a, a huge benefit, um, particularly for Africa, um, due to many of the, the, the advantages of the plant-based platform. Um, and yeah, Belinda and I got so excited by this. We thought, why is no one doing this locally? Why is no one helping him to commercialize and use the research to, to help um, you know, the local community? Um, and she did some investigations and she actually, at the time, she was um, a video uh, producer for 5050 and she decided to do a 5050 documentary on uh, the brew lab going undercover uh, on a fact finding mission. Um, and afterwards, she, she asked Ed if, if uh, he wouldn't mind her trying to commercialize. Um, and at the time, him and research contracts and innovation had no other um, takers, so they, they gave us a chance, uh, even though Belinda and I didn't know much about, uh, you know, uh, biotech companies. Um, luckily, I had the science credentials and she had the business credentials, so they, they took a chance on us. Um, and we applied to the DTI for a, a THRIP grant um, with a lot of help from research contracts and innovation, um, as well as the brew. Um, and we managed to get that grant um, and through matching funding from UCT. So UCT is also a shareholder in the business. Um, Cape Biofarms was then born in 2018. Um, we've since gotten more funding from the University Technology Fund, um, which really helped us kind of in our just growing phase um, because it, it does take quite some time to to build a company from scratch and then actually start to make enough sales to be sustainable. So we, we, we are still um, requiring funding to keep going. Um, and yeah, basically we had in two years of, of, of being a company, we had built our grow room, we had built a small little lab, we were making, um, you know, a few um, milligrams of, of lots of different research reagents that we thought we could sell to um, the local research markets. So we we tried, we did a shotgun approach and just made 
um, NTP the tubulin, we made um, HRP conjugated antibodies, we made BSA, we, we really went wild in those first two years and just tried to make a whole bunch of different proteins. Um, and we were just about to um, start hitting the market um, when, as most stories now start, uh, COVID hit and everything changed. Um, so in January of 2020, we uh, quickly decided let's source the, the gene sequence for the, the spike uh, glycoprotein um, for the S1 subunit and the RBD, um, and let's start producing um, reagents um, for the, the pandemic. We initially thought reagents to help research, and then we thought, why not test if they could be diagnostic? And at this time, um, we were fortunate enough to run into um, some angel investors, angel businessmen who caught wind of what we were doing, um, introduced us to Find, who um, we pitched to, and they gave us a, a nice grant to scale up what we were doing. Um, and we also pitched to the EIB, the European Investment Bank, um, to produce this on a large scale um, for Africa, as well as eventually producing um, therapeutic proteins for Africa. Um, and through FIND and the EIB, Cape Biologics was born, um, which is just focused on our COVID um, response. Um, so we now have a subsidiary, Cape Biologics, and that's kind of our full focus at the moment is producing um, coronavirus um, antigens and antibodies, but I'll, I'll take you into more detail later. That's just the, the big picture. So um, for those of you that don't know, I'd like to just take you into the plant-based platform and, and how it works and some of the benefits. Um, so this, this platform is, is well established, it's proven, it's matured. Um, there are a variety of other um, companies uh, worldwide producing uh, mainly therapeutic proteins and vaccines in, in plants in the exact same system that we're using. Um, so uh, generally how it works is we look for online gene sequences, um, digital sequences from, from uh, databases like NCBI or um, out of date patents or old papers, or we can license sequences from um, other universities or other companies. Um, we then use our um, gene editing software to add the restriction sites and codon optimize for our expression vector. Um, we send to GenScript, who then produce the actual physical DNA for us. Uh, this time uh, for them to actually produce the DNA definitely got longer in the pandemic, uh, mainly due to the shipping. So that was a bit of a challenge waiting uh, sometimes nearly two months for our genes to arrive. Um, then when we, we get the DNA, we, we do um, cloning first into E. coli um, and then into our um, agrobacterium, um, obviously first into our expression vector <laughs> and then into our agrobacterium, um, which is a, a bacteria that naturally infects plants and normally will uh, cause tumors in plants, um, but they've since been engineered to remove the tumor causing genes and insert your gene of interest um, in between these two borders within the vector. Um, so once the agro has grown up and our gene of interest has been amplified, we then perform what's called infiltration which is where we, we dunk the plants upside down into a solution of this agrobacterium caused, uh, containing our gene of interest. Um, and through a, a vacuum, um, we actually force infection of the plants. Um, the plants then sit for, for three to five days, sometimes seven for, for certain proteins. It's all protein dependent. Uh, and then we do what's called harvesting, where they put some music on and they, they pick the leaves um, in the grow room. Once the, the leaves are, are harvested, we do uh, semi-purification, which is just blending, homogenizing, filtration, centrifugation. Uh, and then once it's pure enough, we, we do um, affinity chromatography. Then from there on, it's kind of like the normal um, protein expression platforms like mammalian cells or E. coli, where you, you purify out your protein of interest. 
We then perform quite rigorous um, quality control. We test for purity, integrity, functionality, um, and we also make sure that we, we send for external validation so that uh, we are confident that all of our proteins are what we, we say they are. <laughs> so some of the benefits of the plant-based platform, it is very cost-effective to set up. Um, it costs us a fraction of what it would have cost um, to set up a, a traditional um, protein production system. Um, it also was a lot faster to set up, you know, building a, an indoor hydroponic grow room you can do in, in a few months, uh, two months even, um, but building large stainless steel uh, incubators or fermenters um, is a little bit more of a complex um, uh, science. Um, we also find that our plant-based platform is, is fast and flexible. We can quickly switch and make different proteins um, once we've received the gene sequence, we can actually produce a new protein within two weeks. So it's, it's very fast. It's very flexible. We can pivot very quickly. Um, we don't have to set up cell lines. Um, we don't have to worry about contaminations in our, in our plants. It's a non-sterile conditions. It's also very ethical. So even we've made sure that even we grow our agrobacterium with, with no animal-based products and no animals are used to produce any of our proteins. And then when you get into therapeutics, producing therapeutics in plants is safer. There's no transfer of animal pathogens um, and you do get the benefits of eukaryotic expression. So we can produce complex proteins um, and we often fuse at the genetic level two different proteins. So we'll fuse a, an antibody to HRP or to EGFP at the genetic level and the plants are able to make that, that complex protein. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to, to sell you on the platform. I, I'm more promoting um, the platform for producing proteins for, for Africa and in the African context. But I, I still think that all platforms are useful and every protein um, is, is unique. And we found some like the, the SARS-CoV-2 in a nucleocapsid protein uh, didn't express well in our system, but it's perfect for bacteria. So you really do have to think of each protein as being unique. Um, yeah, so what we did was we, <laughs> we went from lab scales. So two of the, the top scientists at Brew, um, Scott De Beer and Francisco Pera, they uh, started up with us in the very early days. Um, they were actually beginning as interns at Brew when Brew was also uh, starting to develop their, their own in-house um, company. And they, they brought over all the know-how of producing proteins in plants at lab scale. So we, we had kitchen blenders, um, bacterial incubators with um, five litre flasks. We had one um, infiltration machine <laughs> and we had one grow room where we grew the plants and then we also uh, incubated the plants after, um, after infiltration. Um, and as far as purification goes, we, we used manual um, handmade columns that used gravity flow, uh, didn't have a huge capacity. Um, and then we would basically just do ELISA or Western blot to test the protein. So we, we started out uh, at very lab scale um, for the first two years. And then when we received the FIND grant, we began the process. And it really is a process of, of scaling up to, to larger volumes. So just to give you an idea of the, the timeline of our scale up, um, we first expressed our COVID proteins in February, March 2020. Um, we met the business angels and, and, and find, and they all gave us our um, cash injection in April and July. Um, I remember we had all of our equipment uh, on hold. We'd, we'd picked it all out. We'd decided what we were going to order, and we just were waiting for money. Um, and the minute the grant funding came in, it was in the middle of the lockdown and we just pressed order on everything um, and then had to wait quite long for, for a lot of the equipment to arrive. Um, in that time, we, we scaled up our plant incubation grow room. So we went from one layer of um, 
of, of hydroponic uh, grow room tables to, to five layers. Um, we then took one of the warehouses here that was empty um, and we, we built another grow room uh, from scratch, which has um, six layers. And um, I, think it's, I think it's five tables. I'll have to just double check that. Um, and we then also extended our lab. So we, we managed to um, bash through the wall to the warehouse next to us and actually double our, our lab capacity. So some of our um, scientists were amazing. They were working under crazy conditions. They were, there was construction everywhere and we were still managing to produce protein samples. So we are now at a, at a stage where we've increased our grow room capacity. Um, we have bioreactors in, instead of incubators for our agrobacterium. We have a homogenizer with a cooling jacket and a kind of continuous system um, of semi-purification and purification. And we've been fortunate enough to, to hire um, experts in quality assurance, quality control, um, which has allowed us to have a full quality assurance um, process. So yeah, we've definitely grown up, um, but we have not completed our scale up of the, the downstream side of things. Um, unfortunately, when we scaled up our grow rooms, we had some issues with, um, I was actually telling Laura all of our, our troubles. <laughs> um, we had mithis, then we had uh, the aircon didn't quite work. So there were a few heat waves in the grow room. Um, and then we had a flood. So, and this was all with, uh, during full lockdown. So <laughs> it really, um, when, you, when you scale up, you scale up the problems as well. Um, so we've just gotten to a point where our grow room, our upstream has all scaled up and we are in uh, a process of kind of medium scale for our downstream. Um, and at, by the end of the year, we will be at full scale for our downstream. Uh, in terms of our plants, uh, there it is, 12, 12 tables of six layers um, in our grow room. Um, our total plant capacity now is 21,500 plants uh, in total. And we break this up into batches. So each week we, we infiltrate, um, it's about 8,000 plants, and that gives us a total biomass of about 86 kilograms each week. Um, depending on what protein we're making um, and the yield of that protein, we can work out how many milligrams of each protein we can produce. Um, and then our incubation or post-infiltration room um, has a capacity of um, nearly 9,000 plants. So you can see now they're looking nice and healthy and green. We've gotten rid of all the flies and, and everything is, is, is lovely. So yeah, in terms of our current production capacity of proteins, um, we've, as I mentioned, doubled our lab capacity. Um, we've got different teams of our scientists. So we've got our bacteria team, we've got our semi-purification or pre-purification team, purification and quality control. And we went from a staff of, of seven, which is when, when you uh, visited us, Georgia, there were seven of us in, in one little office. Um, to over 50 in the last, uh, in the last nine months, um, which is, it's really great to be able to create jobs for both postgraduate bioscientists, as well as in our grow rooms, we, we, we create jobs for unskilled grow room keepers who, who look after the plants. Um, we've increased our protein production capacity from around 80 milligrams to up to 20,000 milligrams a month, um, as I mentioned, that does depend on the yield. And we've increased our pipeline of um, coronavirus antibody and antigen reagents uh, that we can now provide a full suite of plant-made proteins. And I, I forgot to mention that, that while we were producing these, these different um, reagents, we were, we were sending samples of them to local test kit manufacturers. And the local manufacturers were then um, developing test kits um, with us while we were producing. And that, they really helped as our extended quality control and testing. And, and there was a lot of feedback between us. So it's really great to develop those 
those networks now um, within the country. So to give you an idea of the different proteins we've, we've since created, we began with the, the S1, with the His tag uh, protein, which we now call S1 His Ultra because it, we managed to make it even purer. And we also fused the, the RBD domain to a rabbit uh, FC tag, which also allows for protein A purification, or we've got the S1 rabbit um, protein. So these, um, they've actually been used by, by two members of, of the health sciences UCT uh, groups. Uh, I won't single them out, but uh, yeah, thank you for your support. And they've been developing some ELISA um, antibody uh, diagnostic tests. Um, and then we moved on to the antigen test kits, realizing that the antibody tests or serology testing um, is great for, for um, surveillance and community-wide testing. Uh, but unfortunately for us, the, the test kit manufacturers weren't able to sell their test kits, even though they had SARPA approval, um, to as wide an audience as we'd hoped. So uh, as a, a growing business, unfortunately, we, we do need to generate an income. So we, we moved with the market to antigen test kits. Uh, and we produced antibodies against the, the spike protein and against the nucleocapsid protein. And the antigen test kits work like a sandwich ELISA where you've got a capture antibody and a detection antibody. So we produced those and we're currently in development. Um, and our latest antibody test kit that we've been developing with a few uh, manufacturers is the neutralizing antibody test kit. Um, where we produce the ACE2 um, antigen and that in collaboration with the S1 His Ultra or the RBD rabbit and an anti-spike antibody can tell you whether you have neutralizing antibodies within um, your blood samples. And that's also a rapid diagnostic test kit. So that's, that's where we are. We can now provide a, a suite of different proteins for all these different test kits. Um, our next challenge was, of course, getting into the market. Um, it is still a challenge. We are the new kids on the block. We, we're still having to, you know, prove ourselves. And um, our main strategy has been to, to send free samples to the manufacturers and say to them, you know, test our protein. Um, the proof is, is in the pudding. Um, and if, if you like it, then, then let us know. So... Yeah, it, uh, over the last year and a bit, um, we've been fortunate enough to be on, on two publications, um, proving that our coronavirus um, antigens, our S1 Hiss in particular, um, is working as a, as a diagnostic reagent. Um, Wendy Berger's group at, at UCT um, proved that our S1 Hiss is, is recognized by, by patient antibodies, uh, COVID patient antibodies. Um, and a group in Germany, the Fraunhofer Institute, used our S1 Hiss in their own um, novel um, portable um, diagnostic uh, assay, which is we were very excited about. And our customer base has been steadily growing. We started off with test kit manufacturers locally here in Cape Town. So life assay diagnostic, um, medical diagnostic, Mintec, Lacello Labs, Lateral Flow, Amasutic. We've been um, chatting a lot to Synexa. Um, and then we've only recently started moving into India. Um, we've been chatting to Melogic, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. Um, and also very exciting is the Institut Pasteur in Dakar in Senegal, their diatropics uh, manufacturing facility, um, and then HCW in Texas. And yeah, of course, we, we are still hoping to sell our proteins as reagents to, to researchers to study the virus. So we, we are selling currently to a few UCT researchers some cell and some Stellenbosch researchers. So just to give you a bit of background on the, the local diagnostic landscape, um, we are classified as a, a raw material provider. So 
we provide the, the protein that goes onto the diagnostic test kit, um, along with other raw material providers, such as the, the cassette, the, the membrane, the buffer. Um, we all then supply the manufacturers of the diagnostic test kits. Um, and I mentioned a few of them in, in our customers earlier, but um, we've been working very closely with, with three in particular in Cape Town, um, and we've really gotten far. Um, unfortunately, only one of our test kits has been SAFRA approved, but the rest are um, waiting, awaiting approval, um, or they in, are in late stage R&D. So the manufacturers will develop the, the test kit. They will do some of their own internal testing. Um, they will then send um, a few hundred test kit samples for, for clinical testing, uh, normally with the, the NICD. Um, and once it passes those clinical trials, it then goes for regulatory authority approval, which is with SAPRA. Um, and once SAPRA approves, then they can begin to distribute and, and sell their test kits. So that's kind of the value chain. Um, and um, unfortunately, in a few instances, there, there've been imported test kits that have been prioritized uh, over locally produced um, test kits. And, and this is one of the, the, the blocks that, that we have been hitting up against. Um, but I think we, we, we are, we've developed so much in the last year and a half, and I, I think um, we're on the right track. So, yeah, very, very grateful that we've managed to get one test kit approved by SAPRA. Um, and then just moving on to some of our more international and, and recent collaborations. Um, I'm not sure if, if all of you have heard of the company Melogic. They're one of the the biggest diagnostic test kit manufacturers uh, worldwide. Um, and they've recently been um, acquired by the Soros e Economic Development Fund, which is um, supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and George Soros, who's a billionaire philanthropist. Um, and they've bought over Melogic uh, to create a social enterprise, which is basically to produce affordable diagnostics um, for the global south and, and not focused on, on profit, but focused on um, getting diagnostics out there to those who really need it. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, and Melogic, as well as Global Access Diagnostics, are, are keen to collaborate with us. Um, and we are in the process of producing a few antibodies from sequences they've sent us for Ebola and malaria. Um, these are in R&D and there's yellow fever antibodies coming soon. So yeah, this is a really great opportunity for us. Um, Melogic has also uh, invested in um, the Institut Pasteur in Dakar um, to generate what's called diatropics. Um, and Senegal is, is really um, booming at the moment. Um, there's all kinds of uh, foreign investment in, in vaccine manufacturing, test kit manufacturing. There's a whole kind of um, uh, biotech park or science hub that's de developing there. Um, and they've actually invited us to be part of the value chain there. So um, we've just got to crack these, these antibodies now and send them some samples. And then we can um, hopefully be able to supply Senegal, um, as well as South Africa with, with proteins. So that's very, very exciting. And yeah, uh, sure, I actually have no idea what the time is. <laughs> I can't see, but I think I'm good. Um, so yeah, the, the, the difference between what we are currently doing, which is producing uh, diagnostic proteins or diagnostic reagents or research reagents, um, and eventually producing the, the exact same proteins um, to be tested as vaccine candidates um, or as therapeutic antibodies. Uh, the difference really lies in, in the compliance level. So CGMP is the, the compliance needed to produce um, therapeutic grade proteins that are gonna go into humans. Um, naturally, you want a very strict level of 
quality management um, and traceability um, if you are going to be uh, producing a, a therapeutic. Um, so currently we are working towards an ISO standard for diagnostics, um, but we would have to produce a whole new uh, facility that, that is CGMP uh, focused to, to produce um, vaccines or therapeutic antibodies. There is also, um, uh, well, not an issue, but there, there is something to consider is that plants do, do add a different glycosylation patterning to, to normal um, mammalian cells. Um, and we would have to then uh, gr grow plants that have the, the human glycosylation patterning um, crispered in. They've got that pathway uh, uh, engineered into the plants. Um, but a, a lot of protein subunit vaccines are, are in development, um, mainly focused on the spike protein or the RBD. Um, and uh, another plant-based manufacturer in Canada, Medicargo, um, they currently have their, their uh, coronavirus VLPs in, in phase three clinical trials. So that's also another option we could we could license from them if we had enough funding um, and and replicate what they're doing uh, there here um, so this is definitely a, a long-term vision another aspect of of this is as i mentioned therapeutic antibodies so there are a lot of biosimilars coming off patent at the moment uh, and the plants love to make antibodies the yields of antibodies are really good so we could, you know, produce uh, coronavirus um, therapeutic antibodies. Anti-IL-6 has been approved by the WHO as a, a treatment. Um, there's a few cancer-based or, or arthritis-based antibody treatments, Humira, Perceptin. Um, so, yeah, we, we've got our kind of list for the future, and this is where we're going. Um, but we first have to kind of build the strong foundations and, um, you know, grow our business sustainably. And finally, I will talk about future manufacturing perspectives. So if we do build this large scale CGMP plant-based facility, or sorry, when we do, um, it would look something like this, many, many layers um, very strict um, hygiene protocols, um, quality control. Um, and of course, in, in this current climate, it would have to take uh, environmental impact into consideration. So we would want to incorporate green energy, renewables, recycling, and, and find a way to reuse the water. Um, and we are planning to set up a large scale CGMP plant-based facility in Mauritius, um, and South Africa, and who knows where next. <laughs> so yeah, that brings me to the final um, topic is Cape Biologics Mauritius. So this is part of our EIB grant, which was linked, or, 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 or no, uh, find grant, which is linked to our EIB funding. Um, and the, the EIB made it a condition precedent that we set up a large-scale plant-based CGMP facility in, in one of their designated countries. Unfortunately, South Africa wasn't a member of their list. Um, so this is our long-term plan. Um, and the EIB has given us a, a substantial loan that we can access to be able to do this. So that's very exciting for the future. And I would just like to end off with a quick video if oh I'm um, good timing okay okay please shout if it's not working but I think it should be fine <laughs>
Thank you so much.